Today's scripture reading is from Jonah 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord set a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord. Have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord, Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for this time to be with one another and to spend time in your word. We pray, Father, that as we look at the account of Jonah, as we recall what your prophet did and how he responded to your call upon his life, Lord, that we would not just learn about a man of old and the events of those times, but, Lord, that we would bring it to today, that we would learn from Jonah's example that we would consider this morning exactly where we are with you. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to each heart and each mind, that you would draw us to yourself, and that we would respond in obedience to the truth of who you are and to the call you have upon our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There were three athletes that were scheduled to be executed by a firing squad. One was a soccer player, one was a tennis player, and one was a football player. The soccer player was kind of the brains of the group, and he said, guys, take my cue. He was called up first, and the guard said to him, do you have any last words? And he said, no. And then the guard said, ready, aim, and the soccer player said, earthquake, and they all got scared, and they looked around, and he escaped. So, next, the tennis player was called up, and they asked him, do you have any last words? He said, no. So, the guard said, ready, aim, and he said, tornado, and they got scared, and they looked around, and he escaped. And then the football player was saying, okay, first I say no, and then I, okay, I think I got this. He got up there. They said, do you have any last words? He said, no. The executioner said, ready, aim. And the football player said, fire! Fire! 
and I ask this question, have you ever wanted to escape? <laughs> I do right now, but ne never mind. Um, <clears throat> Jonah clearly wanted to escape. We're going to read the account, the story of Jonah and how he responded to the Lord. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Jonah for a few weeks now. I entitled this series, Lessons from a Disobedient Prophet. And uh, there are a couple things as far as introduction goes about the book of Jonah that I want to cover before we uh, jump into chapter 1. And that is, uh, first of all, Jonah is a unique book uh, of the prophets. And the reason why is because uh, Jonah is not about the words of a prophet. Um, in fact, Jonah's only message uh, is... Uh, his sermon ends up being five words in Hebrew. Now, don't hold me to that ever on any given Sunday morning, five-word sermon. But um, Jonah is all about the actions of a prophet, how he responded to God. And Jonah is a rebellious prophet. Uh, you know, if you listed all the prophets of the Old Testament... Jonah would not be the one that the Lord would go follow after him and his example. Um, he, he did just the opposite of what he, he should have done. Now, we're going to uh, kind of work our way through uh, this chapter a little bit and make some observations about, about the account in chapter 1 of Jonah. Um, and we're just going to start with the very simple observation that every story has a beginning. Uh, if you're familiar with Hans Christian Andersen, uh, you are familiar with something like this, Once Upon a Time, or uh, Long, Long Ago in a Faraway Place. Uh, the book of Jonah, interestingly enough, does not start with Jonah, but rather the word of the Lord is the starting point. The word of the Lord is the starting point. And that's, that's a pretty important uh, observation that we need to make. Um, <clears throat> last night we were talking to our daughter Emily. And in the process of talking to Emily, uh, she was telling us something about, I don't know if it was one of the, the phone or the computer, but she was saying uh, her password. And she said, uh, my password has some numbers that you ought to know. Which then we said, um, is it your birth date? And she said, no, it's before that, but it's very important, and you should know it. Well, we asked for a little while. Finally, we gave up, and she said, it's your anniversary date. And we said, well, that was really nice. And she said, well, after all, without that date, I wouldn't be here. Important observation. It's important to know that things don't begin with us, right? Um, it's real important for us to understand as well that um, everything begins with the Lord. In Jonah chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah. That's the starting point. Um, and that's really the starting point for every life, every one of us. In Genesis chapter 1, we read that in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. And then you see this pattern. And God said, and God said, and God said. And every time it's followed with, and God said, and it was so. It was so. What God spoke into existence became. Um, God is the originator of all created beings. In John chapter 1, John's account of the beginning, he said, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And we know from verse 14 of that same chapter that John is talking about Jesus. For he said, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, every story, every single one of your stories and mine, every human being that has ever lived on planet Earth or ever will live on planet Earth is here because of the Word of God, because God spoke us into existence, because God chose for us to be here, because God had a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. And that should say something deeply to 
us and mean something deeply to us that 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 matters so much to God that you and I are here um, the story of Jonah is also driven by the Word of God um, throughout uh, this account uh, God is the driving force even though Jonah is doing his own thing God is over it all and he is he is sovereign the story of your life is also driven by the word of the Lord. I would venture to say, and I think it's safe to say, that everybody that's in this room that knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you have trusted him and become a Christian, you could look back before you were a Christian and you could see and say, God was working in my life. Even when I didn't know him personally, even when I was not acknowledging him, even when I was living in rebellion, God was moving and orchestrating things in such a way and he placed people and events in my life that brought me to the point that I came to faith in him because God's word drives the story of our lives as well. And the story of Jonah... Um, also ends with the word of the Lord. God is the last one to speak in this book. And the story of your life will also end with the word of the Lord. Now, I won't ask for a showing of hands of those of you in this room who like to always have the last word. But I'll tell you, that you won't have the last word with your own life. God will have the last word. He will have the last word. And it will be something like this. And it will go one way or another. It will either be something along the lines of, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Or depart from me. I never knew you. Not a good ending but God will call it, and there will be no response. We won't have a last word after his. His word will be the final word because his word will be the right word. So every story has a beginning. Also, every story is filled with choices. Every story is filled with choices. Um, you know, we are blessed with lots of choices in this country. I may have shared this story before, but I'll share it just to illustrate how many choices we have. After living in Haiti for a year, I came back to the United States, and, um, and I can remember this vividly. When I was in Haiti, uh, we'd have to go to Cape Haitian, which was about 30-mile drive from where I worked at the hospital to get any supplies from a store. And if I ran out of toothpaste, literally, when we went to the store, I prayed that there would be some. Because usually the, the shelves in the stores were fairly bare. And if there was one tube of toothpaste, I was happy. And came back to the States, and I can remember being in a store to get toothpaste. And I stood in that aisle, and I had tears streaming down my face, feeling foolish because the shelves were full and I was looking at, well, this will whiten, this will take care of your enamel, this will help your gums, this will... I was overwhelmed with all of the choices because I had been living in a place where there wasn't a choice. You took what you could get. Choices are a blessing, are they not? God gives us choices also. He has endowed us with a free will. And with that free will comes responsibility. The Lord said to Jonah, go to that great city of Nineveh. Go. It's pretty simple, isn't it? God had a mission for him. He had a goal for him. He had a responsibility for him. He wanted him to go to that city. And Jonah, at that point, had a choice to make. 
Do I go? Do I stay? What do I do? It's been a little over three and a half years ago that um, through the process of the search committee, it was really clear that God was calling us here. And I can tell you, as somebody who was 50-ish, something in there, um, after being in one place for 23 and a half years, there were all kinds of things going on in my mind. Though I was certain God was saying, I want you here, um, there was some reservations of, well, how will it be? How will they respond? What is it going to be like? I know what it's like here. I don't know what it's like there. Uh, we're going to be even farther away from family. And all those things go through one's mind. I can tell you this side of this, God has blessed us beyond measure. And we are so, so very grateful to be here. Jonah, and I'm not setting myself up against Jonah, I'm just saying I think I kind of understand in some ways maybe how he was thinking. Jonah went the other way. Jonah heard God say go, and Jonah ran away. He ran away from the Lord, and he headed toward Tarshish. He didn't say, I'll just stay here. I won't respond to what God said. He, he says, God says, go, I will the other way. There's a map. I, I, have, I have to get this right because I did it wrong at the 8 o'clock. You know, when I'm facing you, I want to point the other direction. But God said, go to Nineveh. Am I pointing right? Yeah. See, because I've got a screen back there that's just the opposite of yours. Go to Nineveh, and he goes, What? He goes the opposite direction. Basically, what Jonah did then was he bought a one-way ticket to the farthest place that he could go in the opposite direction. He said, I don't want to have anything to do with your plan, God. I don't want to do it, and therefore, I'm going to, I'm going to go the other way. I, 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 am, I am determined not to be a part of this. Um, and so Jonah made a strategic mistake because here is a fact. You cannot escape God. You cannot. You can't get away from God. Um, now, if you're, if you're living in obedience with God, that's kind of a reassuring thing, isn't it? It can be reassuring to know, you know, sometimes we're, we're hurting, we're distraught, and it's a comforting thing to know that God is right there and he's going to be with me. But there are other times when we're not exactly where we should be in our relationship with God and to know you can't get away from him can be a little disconcerting. Kim already read part of this, but I'm going to read to you this is the words of David, and David had David knew some about rebellion and disobedience, and he 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 wrote, "Where can I go from your spirit? Can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast." If I say, surely darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. David's saying, I can't get away from you. I cannot escape. And Jonah is about ready to discover he can't escape from God either. Um, he takes off, and he's on that boat. And what happens? Um, a storm comes up. And they, 
they're doing everything they can to stay afloat. Everything's overboard. Which is a reminder also, if you're disobeying God, it won't just cost you. It'll cost other people as well. There are many people whose hearts can be broken and lives disrupted by our disobedience. They lost everything on that boat, didn't they? They had to throw it all overboard in an effort to save their lives and the life of Jonah. And Jonah is so bent on not obeying God. You know, they, they cast lots. They get to the point. They know it's him. They ask him, who are you? He gives them basically his pedigree. I'm a Hebrew, I'm a Jew, I'm a prophet of Israel. Uh, I, I worship the God who made the sea and the earth. And they said, what must we do to you so that the sea will calm? He doesn't say, turn the boat around and take me back, does he? He doesn't say, just head me back where we started and I'll go do what I'm supposed to do. No, he says, throw me other overboard. Jonah would rather die at this point than do what God wanted him to do. We have a saying in this country, cut off your nose to spite your face, right? That it's like Jonah is determined that he will not do what the Lord is commanding him to do. And here you have these sailors um, who are trying to save his life. They're doing everything they can. They're rowing uh, harder. They're working harder to, to save him. And the seas are growing more wild. And then you have the sailors that go beyond that and they start praying and they pray to the Lord uh, himself that they wouldn't be guilty of killing innocent blood. Every story has a beginning. Every story has choices. And every choice has consequences. Every choice has consequences. The sailors, after throwing Jonah overboard they become believers in God. It tells us in verse 16 that these men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows to the Lord. What's that saying? They were converted. They came to believe in the one true living God. Um, this, Think about this for a moment. The story of Jonah is like the reversal of the story of Noah. Right? Noah, this chosen man of God who's obedient to God, he and his family alone are saved from a flood. And here you have Jonah, a prophet of God, who knows who God is, who's living in a disobedience, and he's the one that's cast overboard. And you have these pagans who did not know God, who are now saved not only saved physically, but saved spiritually. For they've, they've committed themselves to, uh, to the Lord God. It's a reminder in Jonah, just like it is in the New Testament, that God doesn't play favorites. It's not a matter of who you know or how you're connected, but it's a matter of how are you personally responding to God himself your personal relationship with him and what happens to Jonah Jonah goes down Jonah goes down now um, Jonah forever Jonah chapter 1 will forever be in, ingrained in my mind from seminary because in seminary I uh, we had to take three preaching classes my, I hated those classes, I'll tell you. I'm a preacher, and I hated those classes. Um, this is how they worked. Uh, 
you, I, there were probably about 20 students in this class. We would be assigned, we had to bring a message. We'd choose the passage. The professor would approve of that passage. And then we would prepare our sermons. And we're as green as green could be. We really didn't know what we were doing as far as preparing a message. But we had to prepare a message. And, and then you had to preach it in front of your class. Okay? And uh, the, your class is there. And behind them is a wall with a big window. And they're videotaping you. Okay? And after you preach that... Um, your, stu- your fellow classmates critique you, and then later that week, you meet with your professor, and you sit and watch the videotape, and he critiques you, basically tears it apart, is what it is. But I, I, I can remember uh, one of my fellow classmates, an African-American, who preached on Jonah, and I loved it because he, he said in only the way that he could, he said, you disobey God, and this is what happens. You go down. And then you go down. And you go down further. And you go down farther. And you think you can't go down any farther, and you still go down. And by the time he was done taking us down, I thought, I was going to have to climb. We're in the basement of the chapel, but I thought we're, I'm going to have to climb out from under the, the concrete floor here. He had an understanding of what it means, but you know, he got it right because if you read this chapter carefully, you see that what did Jonah do? He went down to Joppa. And then he got in that boat and he went down under the deck and then he went down deep into sleep. And then he was thrown down into the sea. And if that wasn't bad enough when he's sinking down into the sea, he's swallowed up by a big fish and goes down further. It's a pretty good picture of what happens to us when we disobey God. It's a downward cycle. One step leads us farther than we ever anticipated. One step in the wrong direction will take you far, far from God. Your story can be one of two endings. Either it can be one of awe and worship to the God who rescues, like those men on that ship. Or in the case of Jonah in this chapter, your story can be swallowed up in destruction. It's that simple. I'm going to close with this question. Very simple question. Are you running from God? Now I want to make it clear as I ask that question that you do not have to go down to a port somewhere and buy a one-way ticket to get on a ship to run away from God. Geographically, you don't have to go anywhere else to run away from God. You can run away from God by failing simply to respond yes to what He leads us to do. I'll give you a couple of examples. In Malachi, God instructs uh, it to be said that some were running away from God because they weren't giving God what he's due. They were failing to give him the tithe. Ever think about that? Sometime we, w- we would not dare um, rob a server at a restaurant. We'll give a tip much more than 10% most times these days but we can hold back on God sometimes another way maybe to run from him would be is he calling you to do something I don't know God knows your heart 
I know that when I went to Haiti, when I came to my church and I shared with my pastor what had happened to me at a convention, and I said, I know I was holding back on God and I needed to go wherever and not restrict him to the United States. And he said, you need to share that at the end of the service. There was a couple in the church that knew they had been called to missionary service and had not gone for 20 years and came forward as a response of my sharing. Maybe there's somebody here this morning who God has called and you've been holding back. And sometimes, and I think this is probably the one that is the most dangerous for the church these days, is that we can uh, run away from God simply by picking and choosing what we like in this book and opting out of those other things in this book that we don't like. I read just this past week um, about uh, a lady, an evangelical lady, who's an author of many books, who just recently came out and said, yeah, I think I do support same-sex marriage. Because she's just going the way of the culture rather than the way of the word. Can we run from God? Yeah, we can. Does it have consequences? It most certainly does. Not just for us, but for those around us. And you know what? I, I, am, I am the kind of person, I grew up with Disney. I always like those happy endings. And I don't like the tension of kind of leaving things in a negative tone. But we're stopping at chapter 1. And I'm going to stop right there and allow the Holy Spirit to just speak this to us and maybe for us to hold on to it for a little while and think about it and ask the Lord, am I running from you or am I going to you? Pray with me, would you? Lord God, you who are light and truth, who can penetrate our hearts and our minds, who can reveal to us any and all areas of our lives that may be out of line with your will, your plan for us. Lord, I pray that you would speak to each and every person here this day I pray that you would help them to see any area of their life that is not yielded in obedience to you and that maybe even at this moment they might pray and say Lord I've been wrong and I want to surrender this to you and allow you to work in my life. I want to walk in obedience and trust you wholly and completely. And Lord, for some this morning, maybe today is a day like the sailors to make a vow make a sacrifice to know that the Son of God gave his life on the cross of Calvary to pay for our sins and to by faith trust him completely for his saving grace and to commit to living for him as Lord of one's life. Lord, wherever each of us are in our relationship with you. I pray that as a result of your word and the bad example, actually, of Jonah, that we might all draw closer to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
Amen. Our hymn of invitation is Where He Leads Me. And as we stand and sing this, I invite you, I invite you to respond to his leading, whether his leading is to trust him as Savior, rededicate your life, let go of something that is sinful and wrong, join this church family, whatever God may be saying, uh, respond to him as we stand and sing together.